I would invite you to pray the centering prayer with me that's on your screens. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, may your will be done through me. Amen. You may be seated. So I saw a video this week on road rage. It was a car and a pickup truck, and they were going at it on the freeway. Finally, they had to pull over, and the man in the truck popped out of the cab, and he had a brick he was holding, and he raced right up towards that car, and he cocked his arm, and he threw that brick at that driver's side window. However, the glass did not shatter. The brick bounced off the glass, conked the guy in the head, and down he went. (laughs) Meanwhile, the guy in the car drove off. When we seek to hurt others, we are often uninjured. When we try to hurt other people, often we get hurt. I wonder if somebody hurt you today or this week. I wonder if somebody was promoted past you when you were better, more deserving and better equipped. I wonder if somebody hasn't met your expectations and so you're hurt. I wonder if you're hurt because you haven't lived up to your own expectations. God wants us happy, healthy. God wants us prosperous and peaceful. The Lord wants us to partake of the blessings that we have through Jesus Christ. God has a plan for us to live through. And I wonder, I just wonder, if we have enough time to dwell on the bitterness that comes when we are hurt and we plan revenge. I wonder if we have the emotional bandwidth to sit with ourselves as we plan, how are we going to get back at that person? How is that person who cut me off on traffic, in, the tra- in traffic, how am I going to show them up? I wonder if God's plan for your life and for mine is going to allow us to spend that much time and energy and bandwidth. And so the title of today's message is Let It Go. Let it slide, let it rest, let it go. Friends, God has called each one of us to a destiny and has a plan for each one of our lives. I don't think we have the time or the energy to put up with those things that happen when people hurt us. There's probably something in your life in which you need to say, let it slide, let it rest, let it go. Genesis chapter 29 is where we find ourselves this morning. It's this story between Jacob and Laban. Jacob, as we know, has been called by God to fulfill God's mission to the world. Came through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And he's got this call, this this call of God on his life. And it's time for him to get married. And so Jacob goes over to his uncle's house. His uncle has a ranch nearby, Laban. And he meets his pretty daughter, Rachel falls in love, goes to Laban and says, I want to marry Rachel. I'll work for seven years for you for the privilege to do so. Laban says, sure. Works for seven years, seven years end. The wedding ensues. It's late. They've been partying all day. It's dark in the tent. Laban doesn't lead Rachel to Jacob, but he plays a trick. And he takes the firstborn, Leah, They consummate the the marriage. The next morning, Jacob wakes up, and there's Leah. He goes to Laban and says, Laban, you played a trick on me. I wanted Rachel. Laban says, well, that's not how we do things on my ranch. We give the oldest, and then we give the youngest. If you'd like the youngest, it'll cost you another seven years. What I love about this story is Jacob's reaction. Jacob does not throw a fit. Jacob does not throw a punch. Jacob does not throw in the towel. Jacob lets it rest. Jacob lets it slide. Jacob lets it go. Why does he do that? I think it's because Jacob knew that God was at work. Jacob knew that God had a plan. Jacob knew that God was up to something in his life. I think God has a plan for you. I think God is up to something in your life. And so when you are hurt like Jacob was hurt, what's it like to take the same stance? Rest in faith, remain steadfast, that God is at work 
through that hurt and through how we handle that hurt. Learn from Jacob. Let it slide, let it rest, let it go. You know, back in March of 1944, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt was meeting in his White House office with a new curate from St. John's Episcopal Church across the street, a couple other people, and they were planning his annual anniversary of his inauguration. And after some discussion, the young curate, his name was Reverend Howard jo Johnson, Howard Johnson took some notes, went back to his office, and he wrote up the liturgy for this very special occasion. And in that liturgy, he included a collect that's still in your prayer book. It's called the Collect for, of Prayer for One's Enemies. Okay? He wrote up that liturgy. He showed it to his bosses. His bosses took one look at it, and they said, wait a minute. It's 1944. We have sons and daughters of our people who are being killed by the Japanese and the Germans. We can't put a collect of prayer for our enemies into such a service. Why, America is just not mature enough in their Christianity to be able to pray for their enemies. We'll be the laughing stock. It'll make the news. It'll be an embarrassment. Howard Johnson, the young curate, said, why don't we let President Roosevelt decide? And so he took that liturgy over to the White House the White House reviewed it, returned it to Reverend Johnson, and he opened up to the place where that collect was written, and President Roosevelt himself had taken out his pen and had written three words next to that collect for prayer for our enemies. I like this. And so sure enough, that marked the final service of his anniversary of his, uh, of, of his installation as president. And what did people hear? But humility over hubris. They heard respect over revenge. They heard going high instead of going low. But President, we're at war. Let it go. Let it go. Friends, we know we live in a very vengeful world. Bruce Willis and, and, and Bruce Lee would have no careers if we didn't love vengeance. <laughs> but don't take the bait. Don't hit back. Turn the other cheek. How many times does scripture remind us to turn that other cheek, to, to be the, the tall person in the conversation. Friends, we were reminded in our second reading today when we heard St. Paul say, you have the power to do this because you are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who has given you the power, certainly the power to be president, the power to have a gun. No, the power to forgive. That's the tough work. The power to say, you know what? I'm not going to hit back. I'm going to let it slide. Let it rest. Let it go. There were two elephants, a mother and a father, a mother and a son, and they were on the savanna, and there were a couple of elephants walking by, young elephants. The first elephant was, was rather gaunt, was, was, was kind of stumbling along, looked rather sad. The second elephant looked rather happy, had a, had a spring to his step, and the little boy asked his mother, why is that first elephant so sad looking, and why is that second elephant so happy looking? Mother elephant said, well, you know, we're elephants. We remember everything. There's nothing that gets past us. And I wonder if I were to ask that first elephant what he was remembering, well, he might say, well, I remember the time when I came in last at school. It was a field day race. I remember the time I was the last one to show up at the, at the watering hole. I remember the time when, when people were talking behind my back and I walked into the room. And he said, and, and the mother said to the baby elephant, I bet if I could ask that second elephant what they're remembering, that elephant would say, I remember the time when I got an A on my test. I remember a time when I walked into the room and people were saying nice things about me. I remember the time when I was the very first person at the watering hole. Because, said the mother elephant to the child, we have these great memories and we can choose what we want to remember. And our destiny can be, can we, our destiny can come about as a result of what we choose to remember. And so I wonder what you're remembering today. I, remember if you're, I wonder if you're entertaining thoughts of the people who annoy you, the people who know they're the friends, relatives, and neighbors who know that button they can push and it's going to get you, right? I, remember, I, I wonder if you're keeping score with those who owe you, annoy you, bother you. And I wonder if God isn't asking us to do what our psalm asks us to do today, verse 5 says, remember the marvels of the Lord. 
get your mind off of those bad memories and onto those good memories. We can choose what we're gonna remember. Are we gonna remember to let it slide, let it rest, and let it go? 500 years before Jesus walked the countryside in Galilee, there was a man named Confucius who walked the countryside of China. Confucius, of course, this sage, this philosopher, well known for uh, really reviving the wisdom of his forebearers. And one day, a man came to Confucius. And he said, Confucius, last night my wife ran off with the neighbor. I've packed my bag and my sword, and I thought I'd stop here and ask for some advice first. Confucius said something that's as true back then as it is today. And he said, whenever you embark on an act of vengeance, first dig two graves. Because, folks, this is serious work. You and I know how vengeful the world outside these walls are, how tempted we are to act like the world and to seek vengeance and revenge and hitting back when we've been hit. Why let it go? Because when you forgive somebody, when you forgive a slight, when you ignore a wrongdoing that you've had against you, you make an indelible mark in the world and in the direction that the world is going. Why let it go? Because you don't have time for it. You've got only a limited amount of time and energy. Why dwell on how you're going to get back at somebody? It's just going to hurt you more and more and more. You're going to bog down. It's going to take up your time. Why let it go? Because God has a plan for you. And that plan, as we know from our scripture, is never to retaliate. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, is what the scriptures tell us. I think, as you and I learn more and more to let it go, that God is forming us into more mature people. God is forming us into more resilient people. God is forming us into the kind of people who have power, Bible-based power, the power to change the world through forgiveness, through acceptance, through love, so that we can leave these doors, go out into the world, and be that reconciling, healing presence that God has called us to be. Can I get an amen? Okay, stand up and let's do our affirmation of faith, shall we?